Hi, everyone. I'm Michi. That's the Mihai part. Uh, we are the security team of Prezi, and we are going to talk about how we try to make security a scalable solution. Uh, I will describe your background to better understand our challenges and uh, what kind of issues we are facing. But first, of course, let's clarify what's Prezi. Prezi is this presentation tool. It's an uh, unlimited zooming canvas. Basically, you can create fancy presentations with it. And uh, yeah, well, we came here to share information because this is something that we really believe in. So it's, it's cool to exchange ideas and, uh, and get to know each other. So even if you have any ideas after the presentation, we will be here today and tomorrow as well. So please just come over and, and ask or, or show us what you have. We, we are happy to, to show or demo stuff and anything else. Uh, yeah. 40 million. <laughs> oh, it's on. Yeah, so actually we are a startup, so we are uh, always, uh, we, are, we, we are changing directions a lot of times. We have to be agile, we have to, we have to adjust to the current situation, so we would like to have uh, proper solutions. And of course, yeah, I think in this environment like in security and development, everybody knows that shit happens and the only question is when will it happen? And for us, the more important question might be uh, if you are able to detect if shit happens and how fast you can react on it. And this is important. Uh, I will try to show you with numbers what kind of issues we are facing. So actually we have more than 40 million users we are on cloud, so this is a very dynamic environment and uh, you can't just simply mess up things and go away. So we have more than 400 repositories uh, with, a, with a lot of languages because we believe that we, we trust our fellow engineers. Anybody can use any technology they feel that they would like to use. And yeah, from a security perspective, this is kind of tricky. Uh, yeah, we commit a lot, we test a lot, and we don't see the numbers, but actually we deploy more than, uh, more than 100 times every week, which means that we change our production code several times during the day. Yeah, th this is uh, continuous delivery, right? And as I said, we are on cloud, so we have more than 400 uh, AWS instances. We use Amazon very heavily. And why can it happen? Yeah, we, we try to build microservices. And with microservices, it's pretty cool because if something dies, then, then anything else should move on. So we try to not depend on each. Uh, so the services try not to depend too heavily on each other. And uh, yeah, I'm just talking about this stuff to make a better and clearer picture why, why, what kind of issues we are facing and uh, why we choose uh, some some solutions over others. So, yeah, we, we, we love DevOps, yeah, <laughs> sorry. So b basically DevOps is, uh, makes us effective and independent. Uh, at Prezi, every team who is developing something, some feature within the product, uh, they are pretty much independent, as I previously said. Anybody can decide about the technologies and all this stuff. Basically, we have a lot of mini startups within, uh, within our company. And for this, we, we really require engineers who are full stack engineers. So this means that if you roll out a new feature for our users, then you have to be able to provide the infrastructure for it. You have to provide the proper code. Of course, the tests, monitoring, and all the stuff. So if something breaks, you are the responsible for this one. And I think this is a pretty cool part of our engineering culture, because this makes us able to be, as I said, very, be uh, very effective and uh, move forward pretty quickly. We have a lot of building blocks. We are basically, it, it's just like playing Lego. You have a lot of people, then playing Lego can become a more challenging task, because everybody will change stuff parallelly, and those things can actually break, and that's not cool. Right now we have more than 80 engineers, uh, and yeah, 
We would like to have a solution which is not feasible only for 80 engineers, but it will be feasible for like 100 engineers, 200 engineers, and later as well. So we would like not to only solve the issue now, we would like to solve it for the future. And how can we do it? Uh, we would like to, I will do this, sorry. Uh, we, we really don't want to block, because in, in, this, in this kind of environment, you, you really can't do that. The, it, this will kill the whole, whole, uh, whole concept. So as a security team, I think this is not the typical uh, financial sector part. Like, you can't say that we will stop the deployment now because there are security concerns. You just can't simply do all the testing uh, and, and stop anybody else's work. So, but still, you need to, to have some kind of solution. What can help? Uh, we try to evangelize security. And uh, yeah, this is cultural part. And I, I believe that culture within a company and uh, within any environment is very, very important part of our life. So we really try to, to talk to each other as, as grown-ups and uh, make everybody to understand that, yeah, this is, this is something important. As we were able to adopt the DevOps, so basically development and operations are handled together, I believe security is not that magical thing. I, I mean, I, I did a lot of penetration tests. I, I was a typical rat, uh, rat team guy, and I still believe that, yeah, it's, it's challenging, it's cool, but, but still, uh, it's it's not magic, so we we try to we try to share ideas and integrate security within our environment, and we try to integrate it from a technological part and of course from a cultural as well. And yeah, we are lazy, so we would like to automate anything what can be automated. And yeah, I said that we don't. Uh, we don't really uh, block anybody. There should be always some exceptions. So there are some cases when somebody can't open a Prezi, fewer users can download their Prezi. This is critical outage for us. We, we should stop anything what we are working on, and, and, and there us, I mean any developer, and we should fix it as soon as possible. And as I said, we, we would like to integrate security into this environment. So what can we do? Uh, I think we just have to accept that, as I said, security is not a magic. Security bugs are actually bugs in the software, right? So there are, yeah, a lot of kind of bugs. Some of them are more sexy than the others. Like security bugs are typically the sexy ones, I believe. But still, at the end, you will only have a security uh, software issue, right? So we try to treat them as, as they are. So we try to integrate the whole concept into this one, and uh, basically we, we, we defined some uh, basic uh, rules which can be applied to security issues as well. So if something very critical happens, then we switch to prior one mode, in which case somebody is leading the whole stuff, and actually anybody and all, everybody within the company, every developer within the company can stop on what they are working and they will help you and they will do whatever it needs to be done to roll out the fix very quickly. So yeah, DevOps and uh, being agile is cool for development, but it's cool for security as well because you can have fixes out within like 30 minutes with all the tests, with all the development as well. Yeah, and, and in this environment, you might think that, yeah, let's sit back and relax. We have a security team, it's cool, it should be okay. No, I, I don't believe in this, and as I said, we would like to have solutions which are, which are scalable, which are working in the long term as well. So what can we do to reach this state? Uh, yeah, we, we have to change or, or, or help changing the mindset of developers. We, we are there to not only to make the product itself more secure, but we are there to convince everybody that this is important and, and actually show them differ, different ways how something can be hacked, how you should fix it, what kind of stuff you should do, what does it mean to have a, I don't know, like a CSRF issue, and how bad actually it can be. And not just saying that, yeah, CSRF is bad, because Anybody can tell that you, we have OWASP top 10, there is the list, but still showing them real life scenarios and showing uh, real examples, I think this is the key to, to be able to scale security. So we, 
we try to do this, and we try to share information within the company and actually outside the company as well. And for this, we, one of our main weapons is having postmortems. This is something which came from, yeah, from our um, infra cluster. So basically, if something dies, we have a postmortem meeting and a document which describes the issue, and we will talk about it a lot. We try to figure out what happened, why did it happen, why we didn't see it coming, why we didn't see the exploitation of the issue, and all this stuff. And uh, what's important that we don't just want to hide the issue. We want to have a proper solution, so we try to detect not only one part of the solution and not only one small hole within the, that Swiss cheese, but we actually want to see all, or yeah, we, we really want to see all the possible solutions within all the layers. And yeah, of course, you can have uh, different places as well to talk to people. So, for example, uh, I think this is a cultural thing as well. We have a lot of places where we can share ideas, where we can share what kind of uh, things we found. These are places where any Prezi team can, pro can just have a five minute presentation and talk about their stuff. And we do this. We, if we find something interesting, then we talk about it. And we always try to have not really dummy examples, not just some playground applications which can be had. We try to show the code which they wrote and point out the issues. And this is more, people will more, will more easily memorize it and, and uh, learn from it. Yeah, so how can you actually know that something is bad? Monitoring is a pretty tricky one. As a pen tester, I was always like, ah, oh, log, uh, log correlation and, and logging projects are kind of boring. But as I got to this, I think this, this is pretty cool. You, at Prezi, we have a huge culture for it. So this is part of the full stack. If you write something, you have to log. You have to log a lot of stuff. And this helps us to debug issues, but this is cool because as a security engineer, you get there and you already have a lot of information. So from logs, we, we get metrics. From the metrics, we create nice dashboards. I don't know, like, like some of these, and these help to visually spot if something is bad. But of course, you don't want to sit before the screen all day, so you have to automate stuff. And uh, this is where we try to, uh, to develop a lot of stuff as well. Because we really don't want to wake up during the night a lot of times that something happened, which actually we know that it will happen every day because some backup script is running. So. Yeah, as I said, you can you can try to you can try to watch all the row logs. That sucks. You can check the visual representation, which is kind of better, but still it it won't really help. Or yeah, it's a dummy example, but uh, Audit D is a pretty cool stuff. And uh, let's say that somebody tries to access the shadow file, that's bad. It should not happen. Yeah, you have some automated tools which will do it, but you must know about them so you can filter them out. And if something like this happens, you want to wake up and you want, really want to get the, that text message. Uh, yeah, we, we are a data-driven company. We try to, to make our decisions based on data, so this is why we actually log a lot of stuff. Uh, and we store it, we, we use Hadoop for this. And uh, Hadoop is pretty cool to give you answers for long-term stuff, but it's pretty slow. And in case of an incident, you really just can't wait like 20 or 30 minutes to get your answer. You must get them right now and you must understand what happened. So this is why we decided that we will simply collect all kind of uh, stuff Within, uh, within Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is pretty cool. Basically, you are just sending in some raw logs. You say how, should index, how it should index it, and it will do it. It doesn't matter what kind of data you send in there. And you can have nice dashboards. You can actually correlate stuff, so it's pretty easy to figure out what happened. And yeah, of course, it, all this stuff doesn't stop here, because <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's cool to have all this, but as you, if you think about it, then you will have to define all kind of alerting uh, conditions. And this, this won't scale in the long term. So it, our vision is to have something which will actually get all these, these events 
correlate them, do whatever we know about how security stuff works, and only provide us uh, with valid alerts. So we don't want to wake up unnecessarily. We want to get real stuff, and we have to find some way to do it. And Robbie will talk to you about how, how actually we started to work on this. And I think he has more information about it. Thanks. <clears throat> Okay, so welcome everyone, and uh, as Mishi mentioned, I would like to talk about this uh, thing in the center, so this something thing, like what, we, what kind of solutions which we came up to uh, detect risky security changes in our environment. So first, I would like to talk about uh, how we try to detect risky changes in our code base. So usually this is kind of done via, via oops. Uh, via code review process in, in a common or the usual environment, but code review process uh, blocks the developers. And we don't want to block because it doesn't scale, so we want to come up with an idea or with a solution which, uh, which involves some key code review but in a non-blocking way. So uh, what kind of uh, changes uh, we would like to, to see? For example, the common vulnerabilities like arbit arbitrary code execution, directory traversal, open redirect. These are just some examples, but actually those examples which you might or might not see, these are real examples. So these are which our uh, tool has already detected, and uh, it turned out that they were valid issues. So. So we would like to, to, to see these kind of things. And as Mishi mentioned, we have a lot of different programming languages. So we use more than 15 different programming languages, and some of them, some of them are quite uh, exotic. So, <coughs> we, so of course, there are some ex existing tools on the market to do this static uh, code analyzer thing. But uh, there was no one or there was no one that uh, could do all the programming languages we, we had. So we were like, OK, if we have to uh, write our own rules for all the languages we use, then let's uh, create our own tool, and then we can customize it uh, more easily. So what we have come up is a, a tool written in Python. And uh, basically what it does is really simple. It uh, fetches all our Git repositories and uh, runs a list of regexps uh, reg uh, against it. And if there is some matching, then it uh, sends us an alert. And then we can do either a manual review, or if it's a, a type of issue which is really straightforward, then we can do some automatic stuff as well. So uh, basically, we created it for, for Python and Django, because our mo uh, main website is written in Python and Django. Uh, but now we extended it with a lot of other rules. So right now, we have more than 70 ones. And some of those languages, as I have mentioned, are exotic ones. So <coughs> at the first time, we had a lot of, like, uh, when we started to create new rules, there were a lot of alerts every day, and we couldn't handle it, and most of them were false positives. So we had to uh, do kind of these post-mortem things and come up with new ideas how to refine our rule sets uh, to uh, eliminate the false positives. And right now we are at the state when uh, e even if we have this kind of 100 releases every week, uh, we only get about 20 um, uh, alerts every day. So that's, that's something which we can handle, like even three of us. OK, uh, and why, like if you are more in this red team, uh, or more of the red team guy, this tool can be useful for you as well, because it can not only just uh, check, check a Git repository, but it can also scan a directory locally. And so if you have a piece of code which you would like to scan for typical vulnerabilities, then you can use this tool and, uh, and, and get some alerts about it. OK, uh, so we have more than 70 rules, but some of the, those rules are not so severe vulnerabilities. Uh, some of them are more like uh, informational stuff. So we would like to be able to see what happens in our code base, which can be security related. So not all these seven or 20 alerts uh, a day are real issues. Uh, for example, he, here you can see a rule which uh, detects if some developers add the new uh, Apache or Nginx uh, uh, vhost to our uh, Chef repository uh, because we use Chef. So Chef is an infrastructure as a code solution. And so you can 
store part of your infrastructure and part of your configuration in a, in a repository, just as a regular one as any others. So we can use RepoGuard to check this chef repository as well. And for example, spot uh, things like someone added a new virtual host, like here, it, was, uh, it sends us the alert, and then we can see that, for example, sentry.prezi.com was added. And why is it good for us? Because we would like to see this and we would like to check if it has proper authorization on it because maybe it's an internal service as actually it was an internal service so we had to check if the authorization proxy is set up correctly and it cannot be bypassed another example is like object enumeration which in itself might not be so a serious issue but we would be still want to see it so if any developer uses in our Django uh, object relational map mapper uh, framework, the get by secondary key method. That means that the developer is accessing the, the object by its internal ID, which is just an incrementing number, so the, the attacker can uh, easily uh, guess it. And if this uh, API is publicly available, then the attacker can uh, enumerate our uh, objects like uh, prezzies or users or stuff like this. So, uh, for example, we would like to see stuff like this as well. Okay, so a part of, the, of our code Base, we would also like to see the infra level changes. And uh, in Amazon Web, and we run our instances in, on the Amazon cloud. So, so we would like, to, so we, we, we wanted to have a tool which can handle this. And uh, yeah, we have, I have to admit something we love Netflix and Edda. Okay, so why do we love Netflix? Because one is it's a cool company, and two, because they open source most of their internal tools. So they make it uh, publicly available. And this is pretty cool. And why we love Edda, and what the hell is Edda? So, first, Edda is a tool which Netflix created and which uh, basically period periodically checks your Amazon cloud and stores the state of it in a local database and then you can make uh, diffs between these sta uh, states so you can see what has been changed in your Amazon uh, environment. Of course you could do this with direct uh, Amazon Web Services uh, API calls but then it would be uh, it's not so cost effective, so if you store this in a local database, then you can query it as much as you want and, and it will be still okay. And so this is one part what Edda is, and the other one, it's also a famous uh, Hungarian rock band, so this is the other reason we like Edda. And uh, if you are familiar with the Amazon's CloudTrail service, uh, CloudTrail is a kind of a huge JSON file which includes all the changes which have been made in the in, in your Amazon cloud. So basically this is really similar to what Edda does, or for what Edda is uh, capable of. Uh, but they, they have a different approach, so Edda stores the state itself, and uh, the cloud trail only stores the changes itself. So it's more like, it's better if you can use both of them. So maybe us or someone else will integrate cloud trail into Edda, and then it will have more uh, information in it. For example, Edda cannot see, it can see if there was a change, but it cannot see who made the change. So which Amazon user did the change. For example, this kind of information is available in cloud trail. So if we can just put together these two tools, that would be more awesome than right now. Okay, and what's Security Monkey? So at Netflix, they use this data, what is stored in Edda, to, to, to feed it into a service, an internal service, which is called Security Monkey, and the Security Monkey tries to de detect risky changes. Uh, and we really, really like this idea, and we wanted to have our own Security Monkey, but unfortunately their implementation is not open source, so we had to come up with our own solution, and so we created a tool called uh, Red Alert, and uh, it is built around Edda. It is kind of easy to extend because it's more like a framework. It has plugins, and you can easily write a new plugin, and then it can do more stuff. Uh, it can use not just Edda as a data source, but any other libraries, for example, Boto, to, to, to look for in your S3 buckets for publicly readable files and stuff like this. And uh, why it does fit into our scaling security concept? Because it doesn't block. So it detects the changes in the infrastructure after they have been made. It checks periodically for it. It's quite near, near real time, but it doesn't block the developer. So like after a developer makes a change, maybe after 10 minutes we get an alert about it, if it was some, some, something bad. And the cool part is, if you could see, is that we have just open sourced it today. 
So if you go to this URL, you can, you can check it out, you can try it out. Uh, if you are using uh, Amazon uh, for, for running your instances, then uh, it might be a good uh, choice to try it out. So how it works internally? As I've mentioned, it has these plugin systems. Some of the plugins use the Edda, some of the plugins use other libraries like Boto, and then it uh, can alert us in uh, email uh, or in pager duty or text messages or stuff like this. And we have already written some plugins for it, for example, to check if any new Amazon uh, user has been added or a new uh, instance uh, came up or there was some ports opened in a security group or in an elastic load balancer. So we would like to see these things and, uh, and check it. Um, okay, let's see an example. This is a real life example as well. So we got this alert, and which basically says us that said to me us that we have. So a developer just opened the port 9080 in a security group for everyone. So it is publicly available, and uh, so the port is open. So there is some service uh, is listening behind it, and there is one machine which is using this security group. Okay. So if this service is an internal service, then we don't want it to be to be publicly available. So we contacted the developer if it's it was intended or not, and that was the reaction. Ooh. Yep. So basically, what happened here is the developer made some temporary changes to try something out and just simply forgot to revert it. This is a really common mistake. So, but with this kind of tool, we could catch it and we detected it and then we fixed it. So I think if you are running your instances in, in, in Amazon and you would like to get alerts like this, infrastructural uh, alerts like this, then you should try uh, out our tool, Red Alert. Uh, please give us feedback about it. You are more than welcome to send pull requests and stuff like this, fork it and whatever. Okay, so and right now I would like to hand it over to Attila, who will talk about how we improve our rule sets, how we come up with new rules, and how we run our security bug bounty program. Hey. Let's start with a product demo. Oh, hey. Anyone feeling dizzy? <laughs> How cool was that? So, yeah. Uh, when Vishy mentioned there are more than 80 developers, it means there are more than 80 individuals who has access to start new EC2 in instances, who can commit and push to production code every day. Uh, without us, uh, basically without any control. We are a team of three. Uh, we'd like to be as effective with our resources as possible. And as of now, we think the most effective way to have influence is to influence the developers directly. They will influence the code. That influences the product. And the product influences the whole company. And sometimes we receive feedback which says we are pretty good about it. I really like this example. One of our data guy uh, wanted to have a beer with us. And he knew that we are having a repo guard rule which triggers an alert every time someone commits a password into Git. Uh, and he thought it's a nice idea to, to have us to invite us to Retox Bar this way. <coughs> but what Zotya missed is that it would be a false positive for us, right? We are not interested in invitations like this. Uh, well, it's not true. Uh, we trigger alerts for the password string in a line uh, if the, that line contains equal sign as well. So the only notification we got was Zotya's complaint next day that we were absent. But we must live with that. Uh, the problem with these kind of feedbacks is that it's not really practical. We can't learn from them that way we'd like to learn. Uh, we, we have a lot of questions which requires answers. Most notably, we have a vision, and we'd like to know if this vision and our direction is the correct one, because we are on the defensive side. 
we often tend to think very uh, theoretically about things. And we try to protect against attack scenarios which aren't really probable. Uh, I have an example. So, Nicholas, one uh, security professional who is not a Prezi employee but submitted as a bug about our conversion service. What conversion service do is that it converts Prezi's to a zip file. The goal is that it will go through your Prezi XML, download every referenced image, and zip it together and offer it to the user as a single download so he can open it offline as well. So, all the images are referenced through HTTP or HTTPS, so guess what happened? What if you reference it like file colon dash dash etc password? Win. Uh, he was able to uh, read any kind of files from the conversion services machines that the co conversion service was entitled to. And we tried to come up with many prevention ideas, which were really theoretical. Uh, monitoring file system, file system accesses, uh, processes, uh, and things like that. For example, a CH routing that process. What Nicholas did was something different. He realized that we are running on Amazon Web Services. And Amazon Web Services has something called Amazon Metadata Service. It will contain every script, secrets, and so on that needed by the bootstrap process of an EC2 machine. So, and it's available on a link local address through HTTP. Oh yeah, it contained every secret we had to, to kick off new instances. And I think this is a very cool example. This is something we could have never came up with. Uh, and this story is even more funnier. Uh, Nicholas told us that he's going to give a presentation about his findings. And at the same time when he did his presentation, we published a blog post about our, our side of the story. And this blog post contained five lines of code of the fix. What happened almost immediately that someone reported us that that five lines of code is vulnerable to DNS rebinding. How cool is that? Uh, and we need more people like Nicholas and the others. Uh, we need somehow encourage them to, uh, to help us and, and help us to make the product more secure. And that's why we launched the bug, bug bounty program about eight months ago. Uh, those who are unfamiliar with bug bounty programs, it basically we pay for responsibly disclosed bugs. And while we receive many good uh, submissions and we learn a lot, it obviously has some hard parts as well. So most notably, you don't know how much work it will require from you. Uh, right now, it requires five hours on average a week just to answer the incoming emails. If some submission requires investigation, that's an extra time. If someone, some uh, submission contains valid thing, well, that's an extra, extra time. But we like that. That's why we launched this program. We'd like to learn from this. So far, we received almost a thousand unique submissions. And this is a big challenge, both professionally and personally. Sometimes we fail. And when we fuck up, it happens that we are on the front page of Hacker News for 24 hours. So it's, it's really a challenge personally as well. But it's definitely worth it. Because so far, we have more than 60 paid issues. And while this 60 sounds a big high number, uh, it contains every kind of issues you can imagine. Uh, for example, in the beginning, we thought that click jacking, come on, that's not really a vulnerability, or at least we're not look, looking for these kind of vulnerabilities. Then someone came and showed us that it can be really 
uh, harmful attack if you use it at a proper place. And we, we, again, we learned a lot. How we learn? Uh, as Michi mentioned, we have these post-mortem processes. Uh, during a post-mortem process, it obviously starts with an issue. Then someone, probably who was responsible for leading the prior edge, will write the post-mortem document, which contains some background, some learnings, some feelings. And then we have a post-mortem meeting where any ca anyone can attend who, who thinks he or she has some good ideas. And we try to come up with prevention ideas, how not to repeat this mistake in the future, and how to monitor these kind of problems. Uh, I'd like to tell you two examples here. One of them is quite typical. Somehow, uh, security group policy was misconfigured. Uh, it gave access to our Jenkins master without any kind of authorization. Normally, we use an authorization proxy, but uh, using this bogus uh, security group policy, it, can, it, could, it uh, can, could be circumvented. So anyone could access our code base, uh, or at least some sort of it. Uh, and during the post-mortem meeting, we tried to come up with ideas, how to prevent this in the future. Uh, at that time, CloudTrail was a pretty new thing, uh, but someone in the company had already installed Adda, so we tried to do experimenting with that one. And later on, this is how we created Red Alert what Robbie just presented. The other one I'd like to show is about code and risky code changes. To understand this issue, you have to know something about how Prezi works. So basically, uh, you can create hidden Prezi's, which means you can access it only by the URL, and that URL should be kept in secret and contains a secret token. Uh, and you can comment uh, Prezi as well, so you, so you can add comments, just like at YouTube, for example. And if you add the comment, everyone in that comment thread and the owner of the Prezi will receive an email, hey, you get an answer or comment or whatever, and this is the URL with the secure token that you can access it. Uh, the problem was that you were, or the attacker was able to enter comments using a Prezi's numeric ID. So from that point on, this scenario is quite simple. You start incrementing the database ID, comment everything with some fancy or tricky message, and wait for the responses. And what you'll observe is that emails will keep coming in with possibly hidden URLs. Mm. Solution, don't do this. Prevention, trickier, right? Uh, what we implemented was a repo guard rule in this case. Uh, we set up a filter for every uh, code line that contains direct database access by numeric ID or, by, uh, or direct cache access by numeric ID. Sometimes this is necessary to have for performance or for uh, legacy reasons. But since this is just an alert, we will do a manual code review. And actually, it, it seems to be very effective, these rules. And we talked about a lot of things from, from scaling, detecting changes, and, and our back bounty program well. This whole thing connects together by, by floating ideas around and around. Uh, if you start creating a lot, uh, lot of rules, then you receive a lot of false positive alerts. Uh, if you don't care about false positive, then that's, that's okay, but you know, everyone has limited time. Uh, and the other takeaway here is that you have to 
know your system. Definitely in a startup environment, uh, everything is special, special for your company. So you have to have tools that specialized for your company. We tried, for example, Suricata, but without customized rules, it did not work. Uh, what works, though, is if you build special systems or specialize ex existing systems, so those will fit your needs. Um, we will be here uh, during the whole event, so if, if you want to talk about this, we have a lot of tools that we did not present due to time constraint. We are happy to do so. And right now, we are open for questions. Uh, I have a question about uh, Elasticsearch, uh, which was mentioned before. And uh, do you know how to make this uh, more secure? Because if uh, I'm, uh, I'm good in form, this is uh, not uh, supporting uh, uh, encryption, etc. Uh, so, um, could you s tell us something more about this? Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, the thing is, we don't care about its security. We put it behind a private network, so you can't access it uh, externally. We use it only as an internal tool. Uh, and I think Michi want to... Yeah, I was the one who struggled with, with Elasticsearch a lot. Uh, actually, since you are using HTTP API, you can simply create a reverse proxy and that can support your HTTPS, which will provide you proper encryption. So this is what at least we should do. And the same applies to authorization as well. So we have a... a uh, authorization proxy, which can be included here as well. So you can build around it. It's pretty tricky. By default, it doesn't really provide anything proper stuff. But I, I think we reached a point which is pretty much okay. <laughs>